Stay Hungry Podcast. It's Joel and Andy, and today we're going to be talking about what your SEO guru doesn't tell you. Andy, back on the podcast. Been a while. Yeah. Nailed that intro. Guru? It's been a while since we've recorded, but. <laughs> Can I be a guru? Uh, you're my guru. Well, I'm half Indian, so surely if anyone could be a guru, it's me. I mean, that's ridiculous. That I, I claim it, I appropriate that. What about full Indian? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm half a guru. <laughs> half a guru, half something else. So yeah, so so so, what do you mean then? What what doesn't your so SEO then? That's a TLA. Um, What's a TLA? Maybe not everyone knows what an SEO is. No, maybe what? not everyone knows what a TLA is. Or a guru. I saw you use TLA with the team the other day, and do you want to know the sad reality of that situation? It wasn't with the team, it was with a client. They thought it was an airline. Oh, I didn't Uh, know what it was. Three-letter abbreviation? Yeah. Oh, they didn't know either? No. I must have derived it then. I wonder why they look confused. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh, God. So, so SEO, search engine optimization. What's that, Joel? Roughly speaking, it's about making sure that you appear near the top of the results on a search engine for the keywords, terms, phrases that you would expect to. So in our case, uh, we offer obviously digital marketing, digital advertising for appointment based businesses. So if we had a, an SEO strategy for that, if someone said grow my appointment based business, we'd want to be up there in the mix. Where do you hide a dead body? On the second page of Google. Oh. Was that from a film? <laughs> That's been a shit what, film. No, what, what, what was that film where some, someone died in, a, in like a flat share and they hid the body? Oh, like Danny Boyle or something. Shallow Grave, was that it? I don't know. Yeah, that, 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 was, his, that was his big Pre, break before Trainspotting, wasn't it? No, With, yeah. Um, it, was, it was a Doctor Who. Do you want to know how old I was when Trainspotting came out? Oh, fucking hell, I was seven. So if you think I watched the get the film you made oh. before that, have you seen Chase White? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Not when you were seven, hopefully. I quite enjoyed the sequel too. To be fair, oh, I love the sequel. Yeah. Did it not go down well. Well, it just treads over the same ground, doesn't it? So oh, I thought it was really good. Love you, McGregor. I went to um, uh, it was like a, a press premiere for oh god, what was the film called? He he played he was playing like a, a fashion guru uh, in the sixties. Um, and yeah, went to like a, a press launch and, and met him, and, and, and so he was really okay. cool. And yeah, big fan. Can't wait for Obi Wan to come out. Ha- Hannah's a big fan of you and McGregor. Oh yeah, yeah, she loves like Long Way Down and Long Way Round when he's with Charlie Borman on their motorbikes. Charlie Borman, yeah, he was on Celebrity Master Chef. Didn't was do, he? Didn't do very well. Yeah, he doesn't look like a chef. Yeah. Do you know my friend Frank was on not Celebrity Master Chef, but he was on like the the Amateur Master Chef. Really, recently. Um, uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Because I haven't seen him for a long time. And I was like, Emma, oh my God, that's Frank. And Frank, let's say, in his younger days, was a bit of a tear away. And uh, he, he he was either very nervous or just very sweaty generally in, when he was on MasterChef. But you know chefs are always saying, you've got to taste your food as you're cooking. You've got to taste, you've got to taste. You've got oh, to taste. no. So basically, he served this dish to Michelle Rue Jr. And Michelle Rue Jr. picked one of the carrots off his plate and there were teeth marks in it. And he's like, Frank, so when we tell you to taste your food, <laughs> and yes, you didn't get past the first round. Why? So it's like, Sorry, brilliant. Frank. Yeah. How do we get there? I don't know, but we need to get back on track. Oh, right, SEO. Um, yeah, so what SEO gurus uh, may not tell you, I think basically the, the whole premise of this podcast is, and, and, and there is a premise and a point to it, is that SE, SEO is fuck all use if your website's shit. Yes. So SEO, brilliant, because you want to get found. You want to be page one of Google for all your search terms. And it's like, oh, that's brilliant. Someone, cl- your potential new customer, clicks on a link and they get taken through to a website that's rubbish. Well, that SEO is a waste of money then, really, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, as would be digital advertising. Apologies to my mum, by the way. I just realised I've sworn lots and she had a go at me because one of, uh, she tells me one of Dad's old medical college friends listens to our podcast and he's, quite religious and, and stuff and, and I've blown it so, so sorry Victor if you're listening okay. I apologise I well, did blaspheme though so that's important no no I mean I'm thrown now anyway yeah basically if you're driving any traffic to your website be it SEO 
digital advertising, um, link building, what, whatever your strategy is. If the, if the website that they end up on is crap, they're going to think you're crap at the least. They're uh, so it's like putting um, what's the phrase? Don't put the cart before the horse, isn't it? It's like you, you spend age on your SEO and your ads and your link building. It's like, well, no, if you're drawn to your website, get your website rocking and rolling first. Yeah, and it's really tricky because chances are, you're, if your SEO is good, your website's not going to be terrible because mm. you must have given it some attention. But that doesn't mean to say it's going to have a good user experience, a good user journey, an intuitive user UX experience. Or, user yeah, experience. Yeah, that, yeah. That's a TLA, but two-letter abbreviation. <laughs> oh, I'm on fire today, Joel. I'll, I'll keep this one to 20 minutes, guys. Don't worry. It's... <laughs> And, and girls. <laughs> Why? It's like that today, is it? So I'm uh, just just being politically correct. One of us has got to be. We can't say guys now. It's team. Okay. So yeah. And what sprung this podcast? And he won't mind me saying, Sean. I know you listen to the podcast. Um, is we had a team meeting about your website today, and it's already doing well on search engines after a short amount of time. But obviously, that's a long term strategy. But ultimately, when people land on the website, do they engage with the website? Do they just bounce, or do they look around the website? Do they fill in the forms? Do they do what you want them to do? And in Sean's case, so far, the answer is yes. Oh, God, yeah. What was it like, this average test situation, like four minutes or something? Yeah, so people were genuinely absorbing. And that's mad. So what's the average? About a minute? Well, yeah, if you're over a minute for session duration, it means people are actually doing something roughly if i don't think i've ever seen a website where people are spending four or five minutes on there other than amazon but what did you mention you said um so i mean that's brief for sean like so early days he's getting results but he's getting inquiries to the site and people are sticking around you said about seo being a long-term strategy so do you mean what do some people think may think it's a quick fix yeah exactly that so um Let's let's just use let's just talk that about bloody Google. Car started in the car park again. Let's just talk about. I thought that had gone. Could you hear that? that Let, bloody boy racer. Let's just talk about Google. Um, to keep things simple, if you want to be at the That's top, just a girl racer. I think. If you want to be, fuck you now. Sorry. If you want to be at the top of Can Google, you hear that? Yeah, I know, but no Have one cares. Have you seen the car? It's a shitty little orange car with the biggest exhaust you ever seen, and it always starts when we record a podcast. If you want to be at the top of Google. <laughs> It's not going to happen overnight because the way it works is Google's robots crawl your website and read it and absorb it and look for changes and see how often you're updating it and see if you've got the right metadata, see if the image is the right side, if the pages load correctly at the right speed. Do they load well on laptop? Do they load well on desktop? Do they load well on tablet? Do they load well on mobile? There's a lot of factors and a lot of it is about putting in the legwork on content on technical on sitemap on getting the site crawled and building authoritative backlinks i mean i could keep going but it'd probably take longer than an seo strategy so that's that's the point is the best place for your business to be for your key search terms is the top of google but if it was easy yeah, everyone doing now it, i remember in the old days say uh, a guy I remember, like, literally years and years and years ago, I got involved in a website project. I was doing the copy um, for a plumber, mm. a local plumber, Plumber and Shrewsbury. In those days, it was a case of just saying Plumber and Shrewsbury 50 times and used to do dodgy things like write Plumber and Shrewsbury in, in white. white text. So the search engines, the search buyers would find you, but people couldn't actually visibly yeah. see it on the page. And I call it the good old days. Obviously, it wasn't. It was shit. But... Those days are long gone. It's not a case of like yeah. keyword stuffing anymore. Is so it? I, I was talking to a client on Monday about their SEO strategy, and they need to write articles based on the search terms they're looking to rank for. Right. And he said, "Oh yeah, a blog's three hundred, four hundred words, isn't it?" And I said, "Not, not an SEO article." He said, "Go on." I said, "I said you're talking two and a half thousand to four and a half thousand words, maybe between seventeen and thirty pictures." We did one for that, uh, that healthcare firm, didn't we? I think it was about 5,000 words. Yeah. It was, uh, and God, I remember at university being shocked when, you know, tutors would say, right, here's your essay, it's got to be 2,000. I remember being shocked how to write 2,000 words. 
now like we're we're sort of writing five thousand word SEO articles for businesses every week. Yeah, and I suppose it's the case of the more you the more you do it, the that yeah, and and, gets, and but. knowing the structure, how where where does my H one go, which is your header? Where does my H two go, which is your subheaders? Where does my H three go, which is your sub subheaders? Uh, where does your HS2 go? Uh, straight, through, straight through the middle of the country. <laughs> Nowhere. That's £100 billion, pounds, please. Uh, <laughs> you're full of it today. <laughs> full of something. Uh, yeah. But luck- luckily, Joel, I do have a list here. Your website needs to do five things. Okay. So so let's say you've got your SEO in place and, and you've got your ads working well and you're targeting the right traffic. Yes. And the right people are coming to your website. Your website needs to do lots of things, but I think I've summarised on these five, right? So okay. if you want to expand, the first one look good. Yeah. First bites with the eye. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, you and I have have locked horns on this before now. Um, there's a difference between uh, style over substance and uh, design. So. Um, hard to explain but art exists for art's sake it it it's subjective but it looks not it's the mgm thing isn't it art's grat your artist or something above the lion yeah yeah above yeah drawing line so you in that case it's subjective and people look at it and even if they like it they think it looks good fine but it doesn't serve a function or a mm-hmm. purpose mm-hmm. Design has to serve a function or a purpose. So an architect doesn't design a house without functionality Mm -hmm. considered. And that should be the same for a website. It can't just look good because I could do an incredibly well-designed website, but if the buttons don't work, it's no use to anyone. Or if it can't render on a mobile or... So... No, I understand. So so if, if a website looks crap, but everything works very functional... Or if a website looks great, but the functionality isn't there, you, you've got to have that, that marriage of the two. Like yeah. Steve Jobs said, design isn't about how something looks and feels. It's about how it works. So the iPhone looks great, but it, it's super intuitive and works a dream as well. Yeah, exactly that. So I think, you know, depending on what you're interested in, say you like cycling or Formula One, some of these bikes and cars look pretty wacky. But there's a reason. It, you know, aerodynamics would be, would be a main... and. So they're trying to marry up getting all the sponsors on and making it look as nice as possible. But if that means that every time they go around a corner and hit a bit of a breeze, they get blown off their bike, no good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Yeah. there's got to be purpose. Okay, so people go there, looks pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to stick around. Second point is, works well on the mobile. Yeah. Should go without saying, but it doesn't, does it? So just, if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you're listening to it on your mobile. (laughs) End of discussion. So, um, it's, yeah, most people browse on their mobiles now. Yeah, when they're at work, perhaps they're looking at it on a desktop. But other than myself and Andy, very few people sit with a laptop on their lap in the evening now. They just scroll on their phone. So we know, I mean, obviously we're in the business of appointment generation. And we know most of the, you know, the the appointments, the inquiries we generate for clients. It's it's come with people, people... on their mobiles, mm. even B two B, which is a common fallacy, isn't it? People think, oh no, no, they're all going to be sat there on a desktop. Well, yeah, okay, sometimes. Hey, I mean, here's, here's a quick tip for any listeners: we're B two B. What we do is B two B, and our best, most qualified leads come from mobiles at weekends. Wow, and the reason being is because that's when people have the headspace to start thinking about other things in their business other than what they've got to do that day. And we've also got to remember, I mean, our mentor always says to us, you know, um, when you talk about prospects or, or whatever, you're talking about people. So even if you think you're in the, 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 the driest, stuffiest, most professional sort of industry ever, you're still looking to appeal to people. Mm. And people do browse the internet in the evening, on the weekends, on their phone, mm. Rather than like no no nine to five on a desktop you can't you can't think about your advertising. I, that I love dry dry old fashioned industries. I um so I mean I've regularly on the podcast I've used examples of accountants and solicitors, but I know recently local to us and I won't name names because it's cruel but uh, a real ale 
manufacturer has gone under. Oh, I saw that yesterday. And so. and they make tremendous ales, but I know they will have been old fashioned. I know that they will have been set in their ways and you know mm-hmm. the the reason they went under is because the pub industry has suffered in the mm-hmm. last two years. And yet other real ale companies and craft ale businesses absolutely flourished in that period through home delivery. So without sounding massively egotistical, but I think if they'd have got code break in three years ago, we could have identified this for them. Yeah. And those kind of dry dry industries is, are often full of opportunity because if you're if you're an accountant and you think you should behave like all the other accountants, you're wrong. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. There are gaps and look for the gaps. Um, third point, Joel. Mm-hmm. Um, clearly, a bit, a bit wordy this one. Clearly lay out the medicine you provide to the pain they're in. Yeah, so this uh, <laughs> this might fall back to our mentor a bit too. But if you're on a call with someone, and something you say as well is about you've got two ears and one mouth, use them in that ratio. If you're on a call with someone, you should be listening out for what they need from you and helping them diagnose the problem. Your website should pretty much be doing the same thing. So you probably need to make some relatable statements where, you know, chances are, or you've probably met someone that. So you, you, you slight claims, but... I don't know, what what could we pick on here? Um, well, let's pick on a real ale company. Chances are, all the real ale you've ever drank tastes like it came out of your granddad's armpit. The good news is, and then you talk about, we, we you know, we, we've transformed ale for the modern man or the modern woman or the modern couple, or mm-hmm. whatever it is you're doing. So, identify the pain. So, someone coming to a real ale website the pain they're probably in, in fairness, is they probably hate lager on tap or or mm-hmm. they don't like premix or and they just want to drink something that tastes like beer should taste like. So identify that and then talk about why that's an issue for them and then show, demonstrate how you're the solution. So that might be using social proof, that might be using testimonial videos, that might be using a free demo, it might be using free samples. Um, there's like there's there's hundreds of ways to de- hundreds of ways to demonstrate why you're the solution, and there's no right or wrong answer. You have to find what fits for you. Yeah, and I would say that most websites we see just talk at people. Mm. Um, and obviously, yeah, you can't like I say you can't ask questions on a website. But if you're saying, oh, we do this, we do that, we've been established since, so, yeah, and sleep. No one cares. <laughs> no one cares. It's like what's in it for them. So. There's features and benefits, and most people know you should talk about the benefits, not the features. But to go a step further, it's that that solution. It's not just the benefits. How is this going to solve my pain? Yes. Because bene- everyone's a, in pain. A benefit isn't a benefit without context. Yeah. And so, for, for example, let's pick on Ferrari. Not, oh, my Ferrari, this, this model, this Testarossa, I don't know, can do 0 to 60 in two seconds. So what? Mm-hmm. It's, there's, where's where's yeah. where's the context? Yeah. So, it, to give it context, not class leading, not to sixty of two seconds, meaning you never get left behind on race day. Right, I get it now. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, not everyone's buying a Ferrari to mm-hmm. take to race days, but suddenly class leading. Right, okay. So it's the fastest. It's the fastest in its class. Okay, that makes sense to me now. And I don't get left behind on race days, so you're saying that this model is meant for people who mm-hmm. take it to race days. Have that an example on our on our own draft website. One of the um, things we, we identified was um, it was a statement like um, you'll get a minimum of three of the co-break crew on your account. I was like, well, okay, that that sounds brilliant, but like you say, you need that so that. So that you're covered twenty four seven. Yeah, I've just had, ah, okay. That now that makes sense. I've just had that conversation. So I was just talking to a prospect, and they said, "So do we get a dedicated account manager?" Yeah, you do. Is ours the only account they'll be on? And that's what they were ah, okay angling for. And they listen to the podcast, so they'd be in, they might be interested to hear okay. this. And then, no, no, it's not how we work. So the account manager's job is to know the logistics of your account in and out. It's not necessarily to know all the technicalities of your account in and out. That's what the team's for. 
So if the account manager's not here, someone else could inherit the account and know exactly what's going on. And that was like I just hmm. invented fire. No, it wasn't. She's one of the sole person. Must have she's a freelancer. Yeah, I mean, the, these were bright people, but their concern was that every time their account manager wasn't there at their current provider, hmm. no one knew what was going yep. on. Yeah. I said, well, that's not a business. That's, mad, that's just a group of individuals yeah, working yeah. together. Right, another one, next one, number four. Mm. Sounds, sounds too simple, really, but make it easy to get in touch with you. Yeah, so seven out of the ten websites we audit only have contact details on the contact page, and yet the page that gets visited the most on near enough any website is the home page. So how mad is that? Especially if you think on a mobile now, I just think about my mum here, right? So, mum's mum's got an iPhone and all that. But she wouldn't think to, like, scroll back up to the top, click on the hamburger icon, or whatever you call it, the three lines, to then drop down to the contact page, to then get the details to contact that person. She'd just be like, uh, where, where? and she'd go off elsewhere. Yeah. And I'd say there's probably quite a few people, like, you... <sighs> people are lazy, and and that's it sounds horrible, but it's just the fact in this Amazon Prime age, people want to be able to get stuff quickly, and that even means a phone number. If people can't find your phone number or an inquiry form super quickly, they'll bugger off elsewhere, which it, is sad. But again, your thoughts don't count. You yeah. follow the facts. Yeah. So you need to identify very early doors. How do people communicate with your business? If you if you B to B. It's email or phone still, pretty, pretty mm-hmm. much, pretty much. I mean, it, we, you know, we do have some success with WhatsApp and other things, but it's email or phone. If if you be to C, it's normally live chat or phone, depending on the demographic. If if you haven't identified that and made that actively available to your to your website user on the home page, you're losing business. Mm-hmm. Here's here's one of my bugbears. To be honest, I see this more in ads than on websites. Phone number only. So people don't give people uh, a choice. Mm. Now, say if you're paying for an ad and you haven't scheduled a a time period for when those ads are shown. So someone could be seeing your ad at 10 o'clock at night. Surprise, surprise, what's going to happen when they try and phone you? Mm. They're either going to think, actually that office is closed, so I'll ring in the morning, and then they'll forget, or life will get in the way and they won't do it. Or they'll try calling, and surprise, surprise, they'll just get a voicemail. Yeah. 80-something percent of people don't leave a voicemail. So if your your only call to action is to phone, I think you probably need to have a think about that. Yeah. So interestingly, on that point, my um, my wife's uncle, who's um, no longer with us, but it's a funny story, and he won't mind me telling it, was a bit addicted, addicted to the late-night shopping channels. Oh, uh, okay. And pretty much the only way you can contact those was by calling up live because you literally see them doing it on, right. on the. So every time you go to see him, he'd have like a new tea made or or <laughs> like, like QVC or something. Yeah, like that, yeah, right, or okay. like an egg slicer or <laughs> you know tea's made all lovely. Um, yeah, he always had like random gadgets and you know like a toast warmer and just and. Essentially, what they'd identified was, at that time of night, nobody else is offering phone numbers, apart from dodgy yeah, things. Yeah. And the only way you're going to get people to part with their cash effectively is to speak to them, because they're probably half cut, mm. as he was, and mm. he, wouldn't, he wouldn't mind me saying. So, they, they make it, ve- they, they ram the phone number down your throat, you know, and it's always a really easy number to remember. And they just go on and on and on. It becomes second nature mm-hmm. to the people that are watching these things. And they, they wake up in the morning and they've ordered two or three things. And it's, that is kind of a lesson in, in how, you, how your website needs to work. It's like, once the person's ascertained whether you're the right thing for what they're looking for, the next, the very next thing should be, how do they get in touch? Yeah. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. If there are, if your preferred method is the phone, and say for example, you convert ninety percent of people on the phone compared to twenty percent over email, yes, the phone needs to be front and center. But that's when you have to look, again look at the whole picture and think, right, 
we should use a call answering service because there's plenty of call answering service out there who will answer the phone 24 7 for you yeah yeah there are some good ones there's some shit ones so you've got to do your research but if i mean i know plenty of businesses if you call between nine and five no one answers the bloody phone yeah yeah and it's madness to think you know unless you're you've got the luxury of being so busy and so rich you don't care about missing potential new business it's it's madness there there are businesses out there (coughs) in in sectors you wouldn't expect so solicitors being one accountants being another car dealerships being another where i think it would be financially viable for them to employ someone to work nights just to answer the phone phone. because the amount of business it would generate Mm -hmm. yeah so make it easy to get in touch with you maybe give them a choice certainly make sure those contact details are easily accessible everywhere on your website is that fair enough yeah Cool. Now, point number five, the last one now, you'd be glad to hear. I said you should probably offer something for free too to get people's contact details who may not be ready to buy yet so you can stay in touch with them. Yeah, so a value proposition essentially. And what you've got here is uh, a case of not everybody that comes to your website is going to be in decision mode. Um, most people that come to your website won't be in decision mode, actually, because everyone's habit is to shop around. Not necessarily for the best deal, but because if you're having to search for something, the reality is you probably don't know as much about it as you should. So if it's something you buy regularly, like a ream of paper, you just go on Amazon and buy it. You're not searching around for it. If it's something you're... Uh, interested in so it like in my case I like detail in my car so I know where to go and buy that stuff I don't mess about and and even if it's cheaper elsewhere it's, that's not what it's about I know it comes on time yada 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 mm. if you're buying let's say a service like marketing you're not going to necessarily know who's quite the right fit for you so then how do you as a business make sure you capture that person's information and stay in front of them and there's several ways. One is is offer them something. Yeah. So uh, it might be a free consultation, a free audit. It could be a, down, a downloadable PDF. It could be a report. It could be a sample. Mm-hmm. It, 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 hundreds of things. And the other thing is to make sure you track all your traffic onto your website. So it's all well and good being easy to be found because you've got a good SEO strategy. But if people find you and then mm-hmm. never see you again... You've, you've missed a massive and inexpensive trick. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the tests that we'll do um, is we'll go on to a potential customer's website um, and then we'll sit back and see what happens. Do we ever see that company online again? I'm going to call you out here. Go on. Anyone who deals with Andy as a customer, be very aware that he puts things in his basket and then deliberately doesn't buy it in the hope that he gets a discount code. How, how, how dare you? I did. It took me two months with one company, yeah, but I bloody but got it there in the end. Um, no, I've relaxed on that. Do you know why? Because it's sad. Okay, there's another reason <laughs> to save myself my five pounds delivery to know that I've got one over the man. No, it's because of bloody Klarna. Oh. So now it's like. Well, okay, I'll, I'll keep something in the checkout in the hope that they retarget and I'll get an ad or I'll get an email saying, oh, come on then, Andy, come back and complete your checkout and we'll give you free P&P. But now it's like, well, okay, so I'm, th- there's a supplement I'm, I'm, I'm buying and it's quite expensive. A- Andy, I've got to be honest, I'm a bit pissed off. On top of that, I do have to pay for delivery. And that's, and that's I would say, Amazon's fault. But again, people expect free P&P, yeah. don't they? So. I was like, I don't, can, I, can I really justify spending that amount of money? But then, now, they've partnered with Klarna. So instead of paying whatever for a month's supply of these supplements, it gets broken down into three interest-free instalments. And, ah, fuck it. I, and, and, oh, I, it's, I it's, think... It's, it's causing, uh, oh, not problems, not, it, it's causing us to have a lot of <laughs> teas made kind of gadgets like your... Like, I, like I've, I've got a feeling that you are... Klarna's dream customer. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I think Klarna's a... Well, I wouldn't like to think what they're worth. It's scary, though, isn't it? It's scary. In, interest-free. Do I spend... 
a hundred quid on something, or can I break it down into three monthly instalments of thirty three? But ah, fuck it. Yeah, yeah. I've I've got well the jumper I'm wearing now. Yeah, it's like three three instalments. It's yeah, it's, it's clever, it's, isn't it? Yeah, it's, very it's, clever. it's great. But let's assume someone hasn't got Klarna. Um, <laughs> someone comes to your website. They're keen to buy, but whatever happens, they go and shop elsewhere. The doorbell goes. The kids kick off. Whatever, they're gone. You ideally need to be staying in front of them now. If you can capture their details via something like you're giving away a PDF, whatever it might be, um, or or like you say, you, you retarget them. And I'm trying to think if there if there are customers of ours who who we don't retarget for. It's just so important. So so when I started out in media in like 1880 whatever, my boss said to me, and I know I always say this, but it, it, it's still the most valuable thing I've ever learned about marketing. The worst number in marketing is one. Mm. And it, you're in dreamland if you think someone's going to come to your website once and magically buy off you. Once they've gone, you need to stay in touch with them. And this is something else that I was told. If you don't, if you don't stay in touch with them, your competitors will. And it's like, fuck me, that's a, that, that's it. And, and to be honest, that's true with customers as well. If you don't stay, stay in touch with your customers your competitors will. Mm. So just because someone's bought off you, don't assume they're a customer for life. I mean, how many times have people have said to me, oh, my customers are loyal. No, no, they are, but they're loyal to themselves first. So when when they get a pay cut or when their partner loses their job or when they got new shoes to buy for their kids and, and money becomes more of an issue, if there's a competitor to you who offers the same services and is a little bit cheaper or maybe a little bit closer or a little bit faster, that loyalty's out of the window. Mm. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? It's, it's, which just sounds a bit sad. Of course there are loyal people out there. There are people out there who will stay with you even though someone may offer exactly what you do for half the price. But those days are pretty pretty limited, especially if you're selling a product. Yeah. Which is obviously the damage that Amazon's done to so many independent businesses. Which is where you have to look at value adds. You have to look at what can I do to make the experience for the customer better than anything Amazon can do. I mean, my favourite movie store, and I've said this before as well, in Covent Garden, when I was in London, I was in there at least once a week, browsing posters, autographs, um, comics and books. And I took Emma there um, to, to show her this place like years ago. And... It, I mean, she wasn't really that fussed, to be honest. But, mm. um, but I was reading it. it she it was, bought you a book from there. It was, a, it, was a, it was a big book. Um, and I've got the three of them now. The, the original Star Wars, like the making of. So yeah. lots of photos behind the scenes. Oh, brilliant coffee table book. And it was uh, Empire Strikes Back. And it was, I don't know, 40 quid, for example, right? I did what a lot of people will do in a bookshop now. Looks opened my phone, had a look on an Amazon, right? It was half the price. And it would be at home for free the next day. And we were in London till the next day. And so I did what a lot of people would do. And I ordered it on Amazon. Now that movie store is now closed because they just couldn't compete with it. And I feel really sad about that. But it's sort of hard to argue with maths like that. So something I've seen some bookshops do really well now is they have a cafe Mm -hmm. in the store. They... um, they have experts in the store who will say, oh, you like reading that? Well, if you've really enjoyed that, you'll probably like this. So they... Book signings? Yeah, book signings is another. So they're, they're building into their process an experience so, that, so their product becomes experiential. And if you don't do that, and we've talked about Toys R Us before on, on the podcast and the fact that Hamley still exists and Toys R Us doesn't, is no surprise because one is experiential and one was a giant warehouse. You, you you've really got to compete with online. You've got to offer something more. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it is tough. I mean, my my uncle, one of my uncles, he doesn't shop at, at on Amazon. He doesn't eat at McDonald's, and he's he's steadfast to those principles, and that's brilliant. But he's he's in the minority, and and. All you can do is, like you say, you, you've got to offer that experience and you've got to stay in front of people. You've got to remind people why you do what you do, how you can help, uh, why people should come to you rather than anyone else. And that can't be done on one visit to your website. So, yeah. I mean, ultimately, you 
get get your house in order, and then you work on the signposts nice. to get people to your nice. house. So, to wrap up, if you want to know more about getting your website right, there's a few places you can go. Obviously, visit our website, codebreak.co.uk. Um, if you search the Codebreak Club on Facebook, you can join our free marketing community where Andy will run you through all the joys of websites. <laughs> Too, too much free content to be honest. Da- yeah, um, d- at the moment, daily content, videos, posts, just tips to get to not just your marketing looking better, but making it generate results for you. Yeah, and to be blunt, if you can't be asked for either of those, <laughs> visit freemarketingbook.co.uk and we'll send you a signed copy of our book. So awesome! You're laughing. Catch you again, guys.